All right, welcome back everyone. I'm really glad to have the privilege to be the moderator for uh, today's last session. Uh, it is entitled Styles of Writing and Performing. So I'm gonna introduce our different speakers. Uh, the first is Henriette Cortals, Cortal Altes, Sorry for the Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> who is a lecturer in French at Verbeck College and Associate Research Fellow she has published on literatures of mourning in Derrida, Barthes, and Pascal Quignard. Her recent interest and in publications um, include the question of uh, the intersection between law and literature. And she has asked me to mention that she is a novice to Serre and Latour, but enthusiastically so. <laughs> Her paper today is entitled <laughs> Her paper today is entitled What Language Do? the things of the world speak. Yes, thank you. So there's a quotation of Serre, which was already discussed this morning, I believe. Um, and my title has slightly changed for second part, or who signed the contract? So first of all, many thanks for all the beautiful papers that I've um, been able to listen to this throughout the two days. Um, I'm certainly going to come back to points that have been discussed, so I apologize in advance for any um, variations <laughs> or repetitions that will um, inevitably occur. Um, my own take will focus on the question of language and representation of the non-human world. More specifically, I will be looking at how and under what conditions nature as a cultural construct broadly understood as what is non-human, encompassing what the Greeks called phousis, what grows, and the natura naturans, what is constantly being born and reborn, may be represented, spoken for, since the English language allows to, to say that, that the French wouldn't, <laughs> and protected. So this inevitably brings up the thorny question of what it means to grant legal personality to non-humans, a gesture which I believe both Serre and Latour have welcomed. Such conceptualization does indeed in turn invite a number of pressing questions. What form of agency do non-human ha humans have? What are the in ethical implications of speaking for and with them? Is dialogue possible without anthropomorphic projections? So I will start with a few pre preparatory remarks on Serhan Latour's dialogue, Eclaircissement, which in the French edition was published as a single authored text. The English translation, however, um, was brought out under the title Conversation Science, Culture and Time, and bring, uh, but it brings Bruno Latour the interviewer on the cover of the text of the book, next to Michel Serre's name. The proposition is uh, is a rather unusual mention. The, the mention is rather unusual. It's Bruno Latour with, I'm sorry, Michel Serre with Bruno Latour, which again begs the question of what authorship is, what a dialogue does and for whom. So in the long tradition of philosophical and scientific dialogues, broadly ranging from Plato through to the Enlightenment conversations with Rousseau, Diderot and Voltaire, uh, via those of Hume and Galileo, ad ideas are fictionalized in thought experiments. Dialogue at its best, I would say, aims to be transformative, self-reflexive, self-aware, and strive to embody a democratic plurality of voices that may or may not dovetail in a dialectic consensus. Eclaircissement, however, does something very different, I would say. Bruno Latour here features, I would, um, as a very perceptive reader, as an astute interpreter, and at, the time, at, at times a bit of a directeur de conscience with his Jesuit, I mean, which I use, him, I suppose, in the Jesuit, with the coming from his Jesuit uh, background, who in turn prompts her into a journey of intellectual self-clarification, self-justification, or in turn summons him to position himself more clearly, for instance, on the question of modernity. But the dialogue at times is very ten fraught with tension, as Latour is not afraid of naming him difficult, obscure, or simply too poetic. If there is any meiotic process at play, it works creatively for both, I would say. 
the interactions reflected in Inclaircissement can be seen as a rekindling of the, an intellectual tradition of an intellectual exercise, which go, uh, identifies in the practical practice of ancient philosophy, when dialogue between master and student is as much a pursuit of the truth as of self-knowledge. And with retrospect um, of, of two lives and oeuvres that have come to an end, Plutarch's parallel lives also spring to mind. Parallels there are between Serre uh, Biogia, uh, La Tour de Gaia, between the quasi-object and hybrids, between the natural contract and politics of nature, the tiers instruit and the bicameral body of scientists described by Latour. The conversation, which often hinges around Serre's modes of inquiry, allows Latour to better hone his own sociological approach, I would say, to better translate Cerethian concepts and harness them to his, uh, for his own mode of inquiry. So as Peter Womack points out in his very um, interesting book on dialogue, what matters in dialogues are, is not so much the metaphysical separation between true and false, but what he says, the unpredictable semantic energy, and energy is the word that interests me here, generated by the interaction itself. Eclaircissement illustrates here what Serre calls the clinamen, the swerve that allows the transmission of energy that allows for ideas to take their own course and ensure continuation. Clinamen, for those of, um, is of course also the term coined by Harold Bloom in the anxiety of influence to describe the imitation with variations um, that all authors have practiced and remind how for Shelley, there's only one long poem passed on from generation to generation. So I take this serendipity of the Klinemann of Serre and the Klinemann of Her Harold as an invitation to revisit the intersubjective, what, sub intersubjective, sorry, what intersubjective relations are. And, and um, I hope that um, uh, to come back to the, and I hope that, um, and I'm taking also my cue from Serre's relational ontology that he sketches out in the Contrat Naturel. So um, my first section is about contracts, parliament, community, and um, which um, and commutative and distributive justice. So as we have seen this morning, in order to address the contemporary ecological crises, Serre relies on the contractual mode uh, model to re redefine our human relationship with nature. As for Latour, he enlists the political model of democracy to sketch out what he calls a parliament of of things, where science and scientists speak for the non-human world. Both models, whether the contract or the represent or representative, uh, sorry, representative democracy, imply representation. The term representation has, of course, epistemological and ontological associations, but I'm using it here with its common English meaning, oblivious of philosophical jargon, as a term that has the advantage to refer to legal representation the spokesperson who will advocate, stand for, or speak for, for a person or a cause. What language do the things of the world speak that we may come to an understanding with them contractually? Um, Serre thus captures the question of language and rep representation, which has, as I said, substantial epistemological, <laughs> legal, and ethical um, but also affective ramification. The question of language and representation, of course, underpins also the prolific bo body of Latour's work, from Esquisse d'un Parlement des Choses, Politique de la Nature, Fruit to the Fabrique du Droit, and posthumously, um, his public, the, the L'écologie uh, à l'épreuve des religions, to name only these. Um, in conversation, Serre recalls how the natural contract earned him criticism as he was stacked with naive animism, an anthropocentric view of nature, which endowed nature with human qualities. What I want to do here is to retrace the steps of the, both uh, Serre and Latour's reasoning in order to see what strategies they deploy in order to precisely avoid, avoid such pitfalls. In, in Retour au Contrat Naturel, published in 2000, Serre comes back to the Contrat, <laughs> obviously, and elaborates and reinforces his argument in order to address lingering criticism, 
that an object cannot sign a contract. Il a paru fou à certains de proposer un contrat qui, en, qui engagerait et par, par lequel s'engagerait un objet. Rousseau, he responds, suffered the same objective, and yet a social contract which was never signed is the founding principle of society and inspired, obviously, the Déclaration des droits de l'homme. He also words off another misconception, namely that the contrat naturel would have been um, about ecology. The word, he reminds, um, uh, never appears in his book, which he had never intended to be either a treatise on either um, environmental sciences nor an ecological pamphlet. He says he has never been had any doctrine, doctrinal, political, or activist as affiliations in that respect. Instead, he repeatedly reminds how Le Contrat Naturel deals with philosophy of law, and in particular, the philosophy of natural law, also termed lex naturalis, a system of legal norms derived from the natural order itself, um, and also, sorry, derived from human nature. For natural law, or lex naturalis, the natural order is essentially human. It includes subjects rather than objects. In the contrat of 1990, Serre is quick to remind how the French term loi designates both the laws that organize the physical world, loi de la nature, as much as legal norms that organize society. What Serre does, and often poetically so, is in the contrat, is to draw the natural law away from the human components, or um, i.e. human subjects, towards the physical world, i.e. objects, to, uh, to take that dictation from what he sees in the physical world in order to formulate a legal norm. Mm -hmm. So in Retour du contre, au contrat naturel, he makes this, this practice explicit. La philosophie la plus traditionnelle, au moins en Occident, se donne pour but ultime, quoique le plus souvent sans le savoir ni le dire, la découverte d'un lieu fier, again, that, that's my, uh, again, an important word for me, difficile à déceler, changeant sans doute à chaque époque, d'où l'on peut voir en même temps et à la fois la raison scientifique et la raison juridique. Les lois du monde physique et les lois politiques des collectifs humains, les règles de la nature et les règles des contrats. So that the laws of nature dictate the laws of society would seem a truis truism, were it not for the fact that it represents a guiding pr a reality principle to which legislators and policymakers are often oblivious, wittingly or unwittingly. There are several operative words here, un lieu tiers, à la fois, um, that define a third space, a vantage point from which one can apprehend at once the scientific reason and legal reason. Mm. So again, that's a sort of passage or translation point um, from one place to another. So um, a sort of passage in Nord-West here that allows him mm. to be at both places at the same time. And that's what interests me. So what Serre reformulates and elaborates upon is how the law masters authority from the synoptic quality of this vantage point and from the hybridity of its roots, both grounded in the physical and the political world. The second point Serre makes um, is that the contrat naturel is for most about who or what may become a subject of law. In other words, whom or what may be granted legal personality. Qui a le droit de devenir sujet de droit? Si l'histoire montre quelque chose, toute l'histoire du droit montre l'universalisation progressive du droit à devenir sujet de droit. Les esclaves, anciennement le devoir, les enfants, par la suite, les femmes, beaucoup plus récemment, décisions dont la date récente fait honte à, à l'humanité, etc. Two questions, so I'm, I'm cutting my, my quotations here. Um, oh, yeah, I need to go. The question, uh, the question of who is granted legal status is a cultural matter that has evolved over time with our capacity to be inclusive, to be able to recognize commonalities among what was perceived as different, um, as well as the need to protect minorities and the vulnerable. Nature, which has been our host and our home, oikos, has been neglected, abused, depleted, victim of human parasitism. parasitism. And Serre remarks how this negligence and parasitism 
has taken off ever since the Industrial Revolution up to the Anthropocene. And he adds, it is doubly ironic that the start of the Industrial Revolution roughly coincides with the Déclaration Universelle des Lois de l'Homme, which overtly drew on natural law. In the contrat, the section Equilibre Serre takes up, without me naming it, the classical Aristotel Aristotelian distinction between commutative and distributive justice, the, form in, the former defining equitable, balanced, symmetrical contractual exchanges, the latter granting statutory rights to subjects and objects. Commutative justice thus defines the contractual model. Distributive con um, justice, to the contrary, defines statutory law as expressed in the Déclaration Universelle, which Serre argues should extend to nature, or Bruno Latour's proposition for a parliament of things, where the interest of nature, the system of, is spoken for and represented by a body of scientists, as we've seen. So both, however, imply a legal fiction, which to my knowledge is never explicitly named, neither by Nasser nor Latour, and only obliquely alluded to in the unanswered interrogation that makes up the line and the last line of the contrat. Vais je la signer? The haunting question. Um, ben je l'ai signé, meaning uh, is la nature va-t-elle signer le contrat? And this haunting question here bears all the weight of the extreme precarity of the ecological project. Let me make the, a brief detour through, the, through some of the doctrine on legal, legal fictions for elaborating on this. So legal fictions are ubiquitous, ubiquitous even though not systematic. In, in the law's attempt to formalize reality, legal fictions are since the early stages of Roman law used to extend the law to situations that are unforeseen. So they are by nature imprecise as they assimilate one situation to another, one category to another, knowing that you never assimilate what is already similar and subsumable to, uh, into a same category. So legal personality attributed for, to organizations, for instance, is not a legal fiction per se. It is, it can be seen as a transposition from the concrete to the virtual, as it is about granting rights and obligations to a group of person, an abstract entity headed by a person rather than a single person. But in our case, sorry, 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 sorry. Oh. <laughs> so, In the case in point, namely granting. <laughs> in the case in point, namely granting legal personhood to nature rests on a fiction since that would extend rights and obligations to an entity that on the face of it does not have that defining characteristic of a person. So nature has agency undoubtedly, the climate crisis and the COVID pandemic have made all, us all too aware of the reversal of passive and active roles. Um, but uh, between um, each nature and, and humans. Um, but, um, and though, but mainly the question is who does, but is that objects don't speak? Uh, and it's, um, so sorry, I'm a bit lost here after the, and it is difficult to see how it will fulfill, how nature can fulfill obligations. So what interests me here is how legal fictions are a device that allow to apply an existing regime to a situation or an ensemble of facts that is not yet governed by its own, that has not yet, is not yet governed by its own regime. In that sense, um, legal fictions can be seen to be creative of a new reality and have a performative value. So um, I'm taking here my, my, uh, my cue from um, Le Droit ou Le Paradoxe du Jeu uh, on, on that defines, uh, so, um, that defines a bit further this idea of legal fiction. So loin de représenter un dysfonctionnement de la discursivité juridique, les fictions ne font que pousser la limite de l'efficace propre d'un discours tel que le récit ou le performatif résolument installé dans sa réalité. Les juristes classiques feignent de croire que les fictions sont des réels méconnus ou dénaturés et qu'il ne devrait être possible de s'en passer pour atteindre sans détourner à fils la réalité telle qu'elle est. 
Mais dès lors que cette réalité échappe nécessairement, puisqu'elle n'est jamais que le produit d'une nomination conventionnelle, la fiction apparaît moins comme un défaut que comme un révélateur de la littérature, de la, pardon, de la nature du discours juridique. So legal fictions are thus a way to overcome conventional nominations and create new ones. As Hans Weiger, I don't know how to pronounce German, but Hans Weiger uh, put it in his, uh, has put it um, in his as if philosophy. Sorry, as uh, Weiger has put it in his as if philosophy, legal fictions are paradoxically a twist of reality, a tool used to enhance our understanding of, of and knowledge of reality, a means to an end. It is unsurprising then that Serre never mentioned such mechanism, which sits uncomfortably with his own intellectual approach based on natural law and, is mostly, and which is mostly deductive. Le contrat naturel indeed multiplies images drawn from the natural world and ancient traditions. To start with Goya's fighter who are bogged down in mud and quick fan, the navigators who brave the elements as metaphors for governance the mathematician who draws the first line in the sand, or the image of ropes used in sailing, the slack, jeu, that allows for flexibility and enhanced strength in the contract that ties the helmet who steers his vessel to the sea, or to, yeah, <laughs> and the elements around him. That being said, Serre, of course, welcomed the fact that rivers and other natural entities have been granted legal personality, such as the river or uh, rivers in Ecuador or uh, Colombia, New Zealand, or the current project for the River Loire to become a legal entity. But this phenomenon begs many questions. First, firstly, what uh, that of delineation? Where does an ecos ecosystem materially start and end? How do we circumscribe its rights and its obligations? If all biotic and abiotic matter mesh and are inextricably linked, how we do, do we determine where an, eco, um, sorry, where an ecosystem starts and ends in the case of rivers and their subsidiaries? So secondly, if rights um, ensure protection, it is not clear by contrast what the notion of responsibility or obligations would entail. And, um, and finally, to come back to my titular question, what language do the things, uh, things of the world speak? Legal personality brings with it a system of guardianship that, book, that works both with the contractual and parliamentary uh, models proposed respectively by Serra and Latour for both the scientists, science and the scientists which would, should be distinguished, are appointed to be representatives. Latour elaborates <clears throat> on the notion of the tiers instruit already in the contrat naturel. In his Guide d'un Parlement des choses, he calls upon the old principle that defines the science as an adéquation rei intellectus to justify their power of representation. Under this dispensation, science has, I quote in French, uh, uh, as um, Isabelle Stanger um, has said, le pouvoir de conférer aux choses, le pouvoir de conférer à l'expérimentateur, le pouvoir de parler en leur nom. The image of percolation and trickling down conveyed by these multiple re repetitions institutes the scientist, and in particular the experimental scientist, as the rightful spokesman of things. La Tour, the sociologist, is of course well aware that science is made politically biased and that the production of science is fraught with conflicts of interest. And it is for that reason, too, that granting legal personality to natural elements may have an unwanted side effect, the, abuse, um, the abusive monetization of primary resources. So I'm going to conclude very quickly. <laughs> it is perhaps for that on another fiction, of course, it is perhaps for that reason that Michel Serre proposes another fiction, not so much legal, but philosophical this time, that of the quasi-object, which we have discussed this morning and throughout the conference, which defines what is known as a relational ontology, where the opposition between passive and active roles collapsed, and where identities are always authorized and do intermesh. That is, of course, also true of the quasi-subject. The subject is for most intersubjective. 
and the, the image um, Serre uses in the parasite or re uh, describes in the para uh, in Le Parasite is that of um, Ulysses pushed, floating, tossed about by the waves and the undertow, saved from the shipwreck, but appears naked um, subject, uh, the, a naked subject beneath. It is telling, I think, in that respect, that the contrat ends on two interrogations. Qui suis-je maintenant pour quelques secondes? And then, dois-je la laisser signer, la nature? And so I'm going to end on by with the last word by reading this last beautiful passage of uh, Michel Serre. Um, <laughs> Qui suis-je une trémulation de néant vivant dans un séisme permanent? Or, pendant un moment de bonheur profond à mon corps vacillant, vient s'unir la terre spasmodique. Qui suis-je maintenant pour quelques secondes? Et, and I'm going to finish with that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we're gonna like have the question at the end of the session. So I'm gonna introduce now our second speaker today for not today for this session, uh, Frédéric Aitouati, who is a permanent researcher at the CNRS in Paris and also a stage director. The main focus on her research is the relationship between fiction, performance and knowledge. She has directed many plays and performances throughout the world, and she is the author of several books, including Fictions of the Cosmos, um, 2011, Terraforma, 2019, Trilogy Terrestre, uh, 2022, and more recently, Théâtre du Monde. Uh, her presentation today is entitled Uses of Literature in Michel Serre and Bruno Latour's Works. So you should be able to connect. Yeah, a few technical things to solve first, and then we can start. Um, Est-ce que ça s'ouvre Zoom si vous connectez en bas sur Zoom, voilà, en cliquant. Mm -hmm. Non, ici. Voilà. Ah, il faut recliquer sur le lien. Vous repassez sur la page. Voilà. Voilà. Je vous donnez des trois. Voilà, et que vous coupiez votre son, parfait. Vous devriez maintenant pouvoir projeter la présentation si vous, êtes, vous avez ouvert, voilà. Donc revenez sur Zoom. Voilà, et vous, donc il faut sur la... Bougez votre souris sur l'écran, voilà, et partagez l'écran. Et il faut que vous cliquiez sur partager l'écran, en fait. Voilà. Là, normalement, vous pourriez... Ça marche ou pas Si on clique dessus, simplement, voilà. Et là, vous sélectionnez euh, PowerPoint, la présentation. Je ne sais pas laquelle c'est, voilà. Et ensuite, quand je voudrais aller... Sur la vidéo. Sur la vidéo. Euh, sur la vidéo... J'essaierai. Ouais, on va voir si ça fonctionne, sinon je la mettrai sur cet ordinateur là. Je suis désolé, c'est un peu compliqué en termes techniques, mais là je pense que si vous. Ouais, j'essaie juste de voir si je peux avoir derrière la vidéo la chargée. Vidéo ouais, elle était sur un de vos onglets, je crois. <rire> Je 
Okay. Et donc là, il faut que je retourne sur les jaunes. C'est un peu compliqué. Ouais, je suis désolé. Sur, sur le PowerPoint, en fait, il faut que vous retourniez. Ouais. Dans sur la... Il y a en bas. Voilà. Et normalement, si vous lancez le diaporama, là, ça devrait fonctionner. Le diaporama en bas, c'est bon. Ouais. Ok. C'est bon C'est bon, c'est parfait. Là, il me The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm extremely happy and, and moved as well to be, to be among you today. Um, uh, Oxford is a special place. It's uh, the place where I met Bruno Latour actually 20 years ago. <laughs> thanks to Simon Schaffer. And it's also a place where I was happy and lucky enough to, to, to leave for ages. So it's a, a very special pilgrimage for me and very happy to see so many uh, friends and, and, and very um, uh, beloved colleagues for this dialogue. Um, very much in relation to what Henriette just said, I would like to talk today about fic and fables, mais je vais passer au français parce qu'en fait j'ai tellement de citations de Bruno euh, Latour et de Michel Serre que je me suis dit que ça serait plus simple de, de vous parler en français. Euh, la question de l'articulation entre littérature et science arrive très tôt dans le dialogue entre Serre et Latour, dans le livre Éclaircissement, dont on se sert depuis hier, hein, page 15, Lorsque Serre raconte ses années à l'école normale supérieure, rue Dulme, où il vivait, dit-il, entre les littéraires et les scientifiques. L'articulation entre science, philosophie et littérature est la matière principale de la première section du livre sur les humanités, jusqu'à la page 57, où le rapport entre humanité et philosophie, humanité et savoir plus généralement, est conçu comme le point de pauvreté maximale. C'est le terme de Bruno Latour qui commente ce que Serre lui raconte. « La séparation, explique Michel Serre, des deux cultures est une illusion, c'est le résultat malheureux de la séparation entre Topin et Cagneux, entre Matsup et Hippocane Cagne, ce, ce, cette vieille structure des prépas euh, françaises, démentie par toute l'histoire des sciences et des arts, affirme Serre. Bruno Latour ne dit pas autre chose, il prend au sérieux, lui aussi, les pouvoirs de la littérature. Euh, en octobre 2005, il m'envoie ce bref email que je vous partage, car il concerne, je crois, exactement le sujet de notre colloque. Je le cite. « J'ai toujours trouvé les littéraires, ça c'est Bruno Latour qui, qui m'écrit, hein, les littéraires plus intéressants que les philosophes. Eux, au moins, ont un terrain, même si ce sont des textes. Connais-tu cette phrase de Serre Seule la philosophie sait pourquoi la littérature va plus loin que la philosophie. End quote. Bruno reprend. Il y a l'arrogance des philosophes, le seul, mais il y a le respect infini pour la littérature comme vérité. Deleuze dit une chose intéressante. Les fonctifs, ceux des sciences, sont des personnages délégués envoyés à la recherche des phénomènes. Bastide avait merveilleusement décrit cela dans le Bodhomme d'Ampère. Les textes scientifiques inventent des visiteurs délégués merveilleusement miniaturisés et d'habitude réduits à une seule fonction. Clic, clic d'enregistrement. Fin du mail. Les deux philosophes ont fait de la littérature l'un de leurs terrains, donc, et c'est le point de départ de euh, ma réflexion aujourd'hui, l'un de leurs lieux de pensée. Il n'y a pas eu en revanche entre eux de discussion approfondie sur le sujet de l'articulation entre la fable ou la fiction et la science, il me semble. Mais je propose de tenter de les faire dialoguer par leur texte. C'est ce que cette conférence nous invite à faire en réalité, hein un dialogue, et je dirais même un dialogue des morts. Ce genre littéraire, antique, que Latour affectionnait et auquel il s'est essayé plusieurs fois lui-même. Une fois entre Tarde et Durkheim, en 2007, à Cerisy, puis en 2008 à Cambridge, avec la participation de Simon Schaffer, et deux ans plus tard au Centre Pompidou, Élie, 
Düring, tu t'en souviens, avec Elie Düring ici présent, dialogue des morts entre Einstein et Bergson. Donc, des dialogues entre deux personnages qu'on rejoue et qu'on fictionnalise. C'est un des registres, et je crois, un des genres euh, qu'affectionnait à la fois la, euh, Serre et Bruno et que donc nous continuons ici ensemble. Si Michel Serre démontre dans plusieurs ouvrages que l'histoire séparée de la science et de la littérature est une construction facile à démonter d'une pichenette, dit-il, il a développé tout au long de sa carrière une réflexion radicale sur les liens entre fiction et science en s'appuyant sur les fables de La Fontaine. Et moi, assez ignare dans le, le, toute l'œuvre de Serre, j'ai découvert cette ligne de force sur les fables dans le beau livre posthume euh, sur La Fontaine et les fables de Michel Serre, édité par Jean-Charles Darmon, paru en 2021. Et c'est ce qui m'a fait replonger donc, dans euh, cette, cette puissance des fables chez Michel Serre. Quant à Bruno Latour, il a réfléchi à la fiction d'un point de vue théorique, dans le chapitre qui lui est consacré, dans l'enquête sur les modes d'existence, bien sûr, hein, c'est « Situer les êtres de la fiction »,« fic » mais aussi d'un point de vue pratique, il me semble, en tant que curateur de ces expositions qu'il appelait des Gedanke Experiments, des expositions de pensée, et aussi en tant que performeur, avec des performances et des pièces euh, que j'ai eu la chance de, 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 de faire avec lui, qui explorent le potentiel de la fiction scénique. Et nous allons voir qu'il n'est pas si éloigné de la fiction juridique dont tu parlais tout à l'heure, Henriette. Ma réflexion aujourd'hui puise donc dans trois sources essentielles, le livre posthume de Serre sur les fables, réunissant plusieurs dizaines d'années de notes sur la fontaine, le chapitre sur l'enquête sur les modes d'existence que Bruno Latour consacre donc à la fiction et à son mode d'existence particulier, et enfin les fictions théâtrales, si la technique marche, euh, qui ont accompagné Latour pendant les 15 années qu'il consacre à Gaïa. D'abord, Serre et les fables. Quelle est l'articulation entre fable et savoir La réponse classique est de dire que les fables de La Fontaine contiennent un savoir qu'il faut savoir déchiffrer. La réponse de Serre, me semble-t-il, est beaucoup plus radicale. Je cite page 52 de cet ouvrage. « Comme les mythes, les fables racontent l'origine. Les premiers, les mythes, celle du monde. Les secondes, les fables, l'origine de l'homme. » Depuis des milliers d'années, elle nous donne, les fables donc, en temps réel, un témoignage vivant de paléo-anthropologie. Nous n'avons rien de plus ancien qu'elle sous la main. » Fin de citation. Parce qu'elles ont à voir avec l'histoire longue de la littérature, les fables, nous dit Serre, permettent de plonger toujours plus loin dans l'origine de toute cognition. Et c'est là qu'il y a une radicalité de la pensée de la fiction chez Serre, il dit « La fable n'est pas le voile qui recouvre les faits ou le savoir, elle en est au contraire l'origine, la source. » La fable n'est pas l'origine du savoir, n'est pas simplement l'origine du savoir, elle est un savoir sur des origines. Pardon, c'est l'inverse. La fable est l'origine du savoir et pas seulement un savoir sur les origines. Mais alors, quels sont ces savoirs que nous procurent les fables Que nous apprennent-elles toute forme de savoir nous dissert. J'en citerai juste quelques-uns. Le livre est immense et extrêmement riche sur ce sujet. Un savoir sociologique sur le fonctionnement des collectifs, un savoir topologique fait de positions, de points, de lignes, de chemins, du réseau qui les relie, un savoir historique qui bouleverse volontiers les périodisations connues. Je m'arrête un tout petit peu sur celui-là parce qu'il est intéressant en écho avec la tour. Je cite page 54. « Ainsi, par la couture des traditions perdues avec la science à venir, d'un mythologue profond avec un biologiste hardi, La Fontaine date d'avant les anciens et d'après les modernes. » Voilà un terme et une thèse qui, lue en résonance avec la tour, doit nous arrêter peut-être. Les anciens et les modernes, ce sont bien sûr ceux qui se disputent au XVIIe siècle autour de Perrault, mais ce sont aussi peut-être les modernes que nous sommes, ceux que la tour a si longtemps observés pour en comprendre l'étrange cosmologie. C'est par la couture, nous dit Serre, du mythe et de la science, que la fontaine date d'avant les anciens et d'après les modernes. Et peut-être que c'est en recousant ce qui a été séparé par la grande bifurcation qui nous aide à penser après les modernes, pour reformuler l'argument avec le vocabulaire de Whitehead et de Latour. 
mais les fables sont aussi la source d'un savoir anthropologique. Et ça, c'est une idée essentielle euh, qui rejoint certaines des réflexions les plus contemporaines de, de l'anthropologie de la nature. Je cite Michel Serre, page 56. « Notre corps, notre chair, j'allais dire nos cellules, oui, nos molécules, restent encore aujourd'hui saisies, investies, imprégnées par un totémisme qui fit alors de chacun d'entre nous un renard, un bouc, un aigle, un âne, et qui dura sans doute des dizaines de millénaires. Même séparés, comme désormais nous le sommes, du monde vivant, végétal ou bestial, cette connaissance demeure, dont la stabilité au long cours nous permet de comprendre, comme si nous y étions, les fables qui expliquent ce qui se passe entre nous, en exposant ce qui se passe entre les espèces. Cette référence permanente, permanente et claire à merveille nos états et nos relations. Nous apprenons l'homme par l'intermédiaire des bêtes. Nous restons totémistes pour plus de la moitié de nos conduites et pensées. La fable ici n'est pas simplement une médiation savante, érudite, mais bien un retour à une connaissance puissante, latente à la naissance. Connaissance ancienne qui relève d'un totémisme inscrit en chacun d'entre nous. Ce totémisme inné, élémentaire, L'éducation, nous dit Serre, s'emploie à le faire disparaître ou de moins à l'atténuer. Or, il fait de ce totémisme non pas un obstacle, mais la source même du pouvoir cognitif des fables. Contre une certaine tradition d'interprétation métaphorique des fables, Serre affirme que les animaux dans, dans les fables ne sont pas simplement des métaphores. Ils disent une part d'animalité en l'homme, un rapport au monde enfoui. Manière de dire que non seulement totémisme et analogisme ne s'opposent pas à la connaissance, mais sont sa source, ce que la modernité a désigné comme pensée irrationnelle et requalifiée en source de toute pensée. Et Serre aboutit, page 113, à ce qu'on pourrait appeler un nouveau cogito, que je trouve extraordinaire, je, je cite la, la phrase « Je suis jungle, jardin des plantes et cage des bêtes. Je me reconnais dans chacune des fables, car je suis l'ensemble des corps fabuleux. » C'est pour ça, les fables, c'est pour ça que les, les c'est pourquoi, pardon, les fables nous donnent accès à une origine, pourrait-on dire, non écrite et peut-être même non verbale, purement physique du savoir. Ce sont, je cite Serre, des messages issus d'un temps à transmission orale ou même peut-être d'avant le langage et conservés dans et par la mémoire indestructible de nos corps. Serre y déchiffre un alphabet de posture corporelle qui constitue une série de prépositions ces schémas élémentaires de la pensée. Et là, on en parlait au déjeuner, nouveau, nouvelle résonance avec les prépositions de la tour. Mais écoutons comment sert les, les traites, page 69. Sous le corbeau, le renard. Face à la cigogne, le même renard. En aval du loup, l'agneau. Derrière l'hôte, le rat. Vers la ville, la laitière. À l'arrivée, la tortue, devant le lièvre. Dans l'espace du taureau, la grenouille. Poussée par le vent, le chêne et le roseau. L'origine du savoir, c'est le corps, nous dit Serre, et plus précisément la danse des corps et leur métamorphose. Les fables sont donc l'occasion et la source d'un éloge de la connaissance par le corps et l'expérience, plutôt que par la seule raison. Éloge d'une connaissance sensible, une esthétique donc, au sens premier du terme. C'est là, dans cette importance de l'esthétique, au sens étymologique donc, euh, au-delà de leur intérêt pour la littérature, que j'aimerais maintenant poursuivre le dialogue fictionnel, bien sûr, entre Serre et Latour sur cette question. Quel serait l'équivalent de la, et donc la deuxième et dernière partie de, de, de ma présentation Quel serait l'équivalent de La Fontaine chez Latour Alors on pourrait, j'ai cherché, hein, on pourrait citer le le Tolstoï de guerre épais dans les microbes, Robinson Crusoe, Crusoe dans Irréduction, la métamorphose de Kafka dans Où suis-je Mais aucune œuvre ne semble jouer ce rôle structurant et récurrent qu'ont eu les fables de La Fontaine dans l'œuvre de Serre. En revanche, et là je m'avance du côté de l'hypothèse, en revanche il y a un personnage mythologique qui est présent, comme vous le savez, dans toute la dernière partie de l'œuvre de La Tour, et c'est Gaïa. Michel Serres s'appuie sur les fables, Bruno Latour sur un mythe. Et quel mythe La déesse de la mythologie, Gaïa. Personnage difficile, colérique, 
terrifiant avec lequel la tour n'a jamais cessé de se débattre. Je le cite, un nom qui complique tout et qui dit tout. Pour reprendre ces termes, l'irruption de Gaïa rapproche, me semble-t-il, la philosophie et la fiction autour de cette figure qui est à la fois une hypothèse, un concept, un personnage, un mythe. Essayons de creuser un petit peu cette place précise de, de, de la, de, 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 du mythe euh, chez, chez Latour. Donc, comme nous le savons, Gaïa est au centre de Facing Gaïa, mais la figure émerge en réalité bien plus tôt, sous la forme d'un personnage théâtral. Dans un petit texte euh, que nous publions en 2009 <rire> au sujet des personnages de la science et de leur absence au théâtre. La dernière ligne de ce petit texte, qui est bien sûr un dialogue, c'est « Ici, Gaïa entre solennellement en scène ». C'est une des premières apparitions de Gaïa, pas la première, mais une des premières en 2009, dans les textes de Latour, et c'est une apparition théâtrale. C'est un personnage qui entre sur la scène du monde. Mon hypothèse dans cette dernière section c'est que le concept de Gaïa trouve dans la figure mythologique et théâtrale de Gaïa une forme particulièrement puissante, pertinente, pour penser le nouveau régime climatique. Alors il faut se souvenir bien sûr de l'importance du théâtre dans la pensée de Latour. Très rapidement, son analyse des articles scientifiques comme étant remplis de personnages conceptuels, la reconstitution d'expériences scientifiques avec Otto Siboum et Simon Schaffer, l'expérience fondatrice du laboratorium avec Hans Ulrich Holbricht et Simon à nouveau, l'importance dans ses premiers livres des microbes à Science in Action de la notion de théâtre de la preuve. Le théâtre avec tout ce qu'il comporte de jeu, de déplacement, de figuration, de fiction, de mise en scène, de dramatisation est profondément, profondément lié à la pensée de la tour, à sa manière très deleuzienne, il le rappelait tout à l'heure dans le mail, de concevoir les idées comme des personnages conceptuels. Mais là où je veux en venir, et là où les choses deviennent peut-être plus surprenantes, c'est lorsque Gaïa surgit. Mon hypothèse, c'est que l'intrusion de Gaïa donne l'occasion à la tour de passer d'un théâtre métaphorique, le théâtre de la preuve, au théâtre, au sens propre du terme. Du théâtre de la preuve à la preuve du théâtre, pourrait-on dire. Alors c'est quoi ce théâtre de la preuve pour Gaïa Dans les microbes, guerre et paix, vous vous en souvenez, dans les œuvres suivantes, le travail de la science consiste à construire des dispositifs de visualisation, les laboratoires, au sein desquels les acteurs peuvent démontrer leur capacité à agir. C'est ça le théâtre de la preuve. Le laboratoire pastorien est construit pour rendre visibles des agents invisibles en leur fournissant un environnement idéal dans lequel ils peuvent s'épanouir. La, la tour incite sur l'invention par le laboratoire d'une nouvelle scène. C'est un lieu où les microbes sont enfin visibles. Or, le grand problème de l'hypothèse Gaïa, ça va être aussi d'inventer ces théâtres de la preuve qui puissent faire apparaître Gaïa, la rendre visible, la rendre perceptible, ou surtout rendre perceptible sa capacité d'action. Or, alors là je passe très vite, mais c'était pour faire avec, un écho Henriette avec ta, ta, ta présentation, euh, c'est bien par le théâtre que le Parlement des choses dans, cette, dans, dans ce, cet étrange théâtre des négociations qu'on avait fait en 2015, apparaît. C'est une première apparition, non pas de Gaïa, mais du Parlement des choses. Mais ça, j'y reviendrai sous dans la discussion. Ce qui m'intéresse, c'est ça. C'est que Gaïa n'a pas de représentation. Et ça, c'est le gros problème de notre premier, première conférence performance ensemble qui s'appelle Inside. Bruno, là, montre le sol en disant on ne voit rien. On cherche à représenter Gaïa et ce n'est pas visible. Et le joke, tout, toute la, la, la drôlerie de, cette, de ce spectacle, c'est qu'on montre quelque chose qu'on ne voit pas. On, parle de, on essaye de représenter quelque chose qui n'est pas représenté. L'irreprésentable, à la fois politiquement, euh, scientifiquement et esthétiquement. Donc, euh, voilà le problème. Nous n'avons pas les, les dispositifs de, de visualisation pour une telle entité. Nous n'avons pas de laboratoire pour Gaïa, au sens où Pasteur avait un laboratoire pour ses microbes. Nous ne savons pas l'isoler, la faire proliférer dans une boîte de pétri pour pouvoir l'observer, car cet agent est d'une toute autre échelle qu'un microbe. 
il est intimement lié à notre propre monde, à notre propre existence. Et surtout, cet agent est dispersé, ou cet actant, ou cette actrice, est dispersé partout, dans le même espace que celui que nous habitons, sans occuper un lieu précis. C'est un, un agent, pourrait-on dire, sans environnement, parce qu'il est son propre environnement. Plutôt que de rendre visible des agents invisibles, ça c'était le problème de Pasteur, le problème de Lovelock et de Margulis, c'est de rendre visible autrement ce qui est notre expérience la plus commune, la plus partagée, l'existence de la vie sur Terre. D'une certaine manière, c'est plus difficile, puisque le but n'est pas de mettre en lumière un agent inconnu, mais de transformer notre compréhension, notre définition même d'un agent apparemment bien connu, la Terre et ses créatures vivantes. Et mon hypothèse, c'est que le laboratoire, le théâtre, vous l'avez compris, est l'un des laboratoires, l'un des terrains qui va permettre à la tour de tenter de saisir Gaïa. Mais on n'y est pas du tout réussi, pas du tout réussi vous, vous le voyez bien. Comme le dit Bruno Latour dans notre deuxième conférence performance, Moving Earth, Gaïa se contrôle elle-même, elle maintient l'oxygène pendant des millions d'années. C'est quelque chose qui est une régulation, une autorégulation. Il y a un être multiple, un être énigmatique, un être qui se maintient dans l'existence sur des millions d'années et qui maintient les conditions qui vous permettent ici de respirer. Pour bien comprendre comment fonctionne ce personnage, je ne sais pas combien de temps il me reste, cinq minutes. Cinq minutes. Cinq minutes. Pour bien comprendre comment fonctionne ce personnage, il faut faire le détour par euh, la définition très spécifique que la tour donne de la fiction. Et là, on va voir que fic n'est pas du tout la même chose que fable et qui nourrit aussi bien son analyse des articles scientifiques depuis ses travaux avec Françoise Bastide dans les années 90 que l'enquête sur les modes d'existence. On pourrait dire que la théorie latourienne de la fiction, et Elie en parlait hier, est une sorte d'extension de l'une des plus grandes inventions de la sémiotique grémacienne, le concept d'actant. Ce concept repose sur une observation. Dans un espace narratif, toute énonciation est une action, et tout sujet d'énonciation est quelqu'un qui agit. Le concept d'actant couvre non seulement les êtres humains, mais donc aussi les animaux, les objets, les concepts. Avec ce concept, on peut désigner un point doué d'agentivité sans avoir à préciser sa réalité ontologique. C'est l'action qui est censée définir la nature d'un sujet et non sa substance pour déterminer son action. Donc ça, c'est bien connu, ce lien entre la sémiotique et la théorie de la fiction. Or, nous ne savons pas exactement ce qu'est ce nouvel être. Nous observons Gaïa à travers ses performances avant de déterminer ses compétences. Nous regardons comment elle agit, ce qu'elle fait. Gaïa réagit à nos actions. Elle entre sur la scène humaine et politique. Elle conspire, elle intervient, elle est chatouilleuse, distingueuse, mais elle est introuvable. Elle ne coïncide avec aucune substance de l'univers, euh, ni avec la totalité de la planète, ni avec l'une de ses portions, la zone critique. Alors, Bruno, a, donc, Gaïa, c'est bien sûr pas le globe, ce n'est pas exactement la zone critique, ça c'était des, 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 des tentatives de représentation de la zone critique. Là, c'est Bruno de, de, devant l'extraordinaire le, dessin que tu lui avais donné, je crois, Simon, euh, plus ou moins issu de, de Humboldt, et qu'il utilise aussi d'ailleurs dans, dans son exposition. Voilà, tout, toutes ces images-là ne, ne permettent pas de capter Exactement Gaïa, c'est la zone critique, mais ce n'est pas, euh, pas Gaïa. Euh... Et, là, et là, si j'y arrive, c'est là que Michel Serre revient. Et c'est là que Michel Serre joue un rôle essentiel, vous allez le voir, comme personnage cette fois, à côté de Brecht. Et j'essaye de vous montrer... Je vais essayer sur cet écran. -là. Oui. On essaie de vous... Je vais essayer de vous montrer un tout petit passage où Bruno fait jouer Michel Serre dans une fable. Si on, si on y arrive. Non, ça ne marche pas, mais je vais essayer moi alors. Moi je, moi, je pense que je l'ai, si vous voulez. On va essayer comme ça. Je vais redonner le... Ah, oui, ah, oui. On risque d'avoir un petit problème de son.
Dieu, mon Dieu. C'est ça le récit. Donc, je veux juste le... Comment Ça marche pas. Et si tu enlèves le... Pas en plein écran, mais simplement... Ah ouais, je peux faire comme ça. Vous voyez pas grand-chose là. Hein on n'entend pas et on voit pas. C'est Gaïa. <rire> Donc, je vous décris un tout petit peu, c'est le début de Moving Earth. Bruno Latour est pris entre les deux images de la vie de Galilée de Brecht par Joseph Lozé à gauche et à droite, c'est les manifestations sur le climat. Donc ça, c'est juste l'introduction de la pièce et ce qui m'intéresse vient juste après. C'est toujours un exercice chez Latour. Le public doit travailler. Donc, le public va être testé, évidemment. Le théâtre est utilisé. Donc là, il y a tout un passage où il ajuste les instruments de mesure pour mesurer la quantité de CO2 dans la salle de spectacle. Et ce qui m'intéresse, c'est juste après... Voilà, donc il y a ce parallèle qui est tracé. J'ai raté, pardon, le, le passage que je voulais absolument avec Serre. On va y arriver. Donc, il y a un trial, bien sûr. Il y a une expérience qui est de voir comment les gens vont augmenter la température de la salle. Et ensuite, il y a un parallèle. C'est le point entre la Terre de Galilée et notre Terre aujourd'hui. Et là où Serre arrive comme un personnage essentiel, voilà, je vous laisse voir. Michel Serre en face de Brecht. Contraste entre Galilée qui disait et pourtant elle se meut et Michel Serre qui dit et pourtant elle s'émeut dans le contrat naturel. Voilà, et ce n'est pas du tout la même émotion. Pardon, c'était pas très. Vous pouvez le trouver sur le site de ma compagnie, c'est beaucoup plus beau quand on entend la, la voix de Bruno et son, et son émotion. Là, c'était un peu, un peu délicat. Je, je reviens à, la, à ma présentation. Donc, l'argument tient en une phrase euh, du contrat naturel. J'arrête ça et je reviens juste à ma présentation. L'argument tient une phrase qui est de dire donc « Galilée disait et pourtant elle se meut, or il faudrait dire désormais et pourtant elle s'émeut. » Toute la conférence tourne autour d'une question simple, quelle est la nature de cette émotion nouvelle dont parle Serre Se mouvoir et s'émouvoir. La terre galiléenne a un mouvement de rotation sur elle-même et autour du soleil. La terre dont parle Serre et la tour a un mouvement d'émotion, de réaction. Et les deux types de mouvements terrestres sont distingués, élaborés tout au long de la conférence. Ce qui m'intéresse, et je vais finir par ça, c'est que ce parallèle entre 
d'un côté Galilée et de l'autre euh, Lovelock, et lui-même une fiction, bien sûr. C'est une expérience de pensée. Et Bruno le disait d'ailleurs, euh, il n'osait pas en parler à Simon ou alors en disant « qu'est-ce que tu en penses ?» ou il appelait Bia Jolie pour savoir ce qu'il en pensait. Ce n'est pas un parallèle qui, en termes d'histoire des sciences, est tenable. C'est un parallèle qu'on peut faire sur une scène de théâtre. Là, on est à l'Odéon. Parce que la convention est celle de la fiction scénique, de l'expérience de pensée. Et c'est quelque chose qui a fasciné vraiment la tour pendant des années, cette histoire de parallèle, de symétrie. Euh, puisque l'un et l'autre, Galilée et Lovelock, utilisent des instruments extrêmement simples pour faire bouger la Terre de deux manières différentes. C'est le, le début du chapitre 3 de Face à Gaïa. Galilée levait les yeux vers le ciel, Lovelock fait exactement l'inverse. Il imagine, c'est la petite flèche, il imagine des martiens qui regardent la Terre grâce à ses instruments, le, le détecteur à capture d'électrons, extrêmement simple lui aussi. Donc il y a à la fois le parallèle entre Galilée et Lovelock et en même temps le contraste qui est le cœur de tout l'argument. Il est difficile, dit Latour, de ne pas être frappé par la symétrie entre les gestes de Galilée et de Lovelock qui ont levé de modestes instruments vers le ciel pour faire des découvertes radicalement opposées. Donc modestie des instruments, mais puissance des, euh, de l'inversion des forces. Et ça, c'est bien sûr Simon qui me l'a appris. Faire le maximum avec le minimum d'efforts, pas besoin d'aller sur Mars, dit Lovelock. Donc, Moving Earth, c'est une expérience de pensée, et très logiquement, euh, on en a fait, la, pre la première de, de cela s'est fait chez Otto Sibum, à Uppsala, dans cet endroit extraordinaire, euh, où Otto Sibum nous avait invités pour performer Moving Earth sur cet étrange stage, insane stage. Et là, vous voyez Gaïa qui arrive sur cet étrange euh, stage qui est à la fois le bureau de Bruno, euh, donc le, la scène intellectuelle, la scène politique, la scène scientifique de Otto Sibum, tout est là. Donc, comparer, tenter de suivre très précisément les symétries et les différences, c'est ce que Latour aimait faire, c'est ce qu'il a tenté de faire lui-même entre Lovelock et Galilée, c'est ce que les organisateurs de la conférence et ce que nous essayons de faire depuis deux jours. Euh, le parallèle est un contraste. Et pour finir, la boucle est bouclée comme ça. Je vous montre une dernière image, puisque c'est la première photographie de scène que j'ai faite de Bruno en acteur à Cerisy en 2007, pour ses 60 ans. Jouant tarde face à Bruno Carsinti qui jouait Durkheim, dans un autre dialogue des morts, bien sûr fictionnel, et dans une mise en scène où j'avais tenté de reproduire le fameux tableau des ambassadeurs de Holbein, en utilisant tous les, tous les props que je pouvais trouver dans le château de Cerisy. Ce petit spectacle, ensuite, nous l'avons rejoué à Sciences Po, puis à Cambridge avec Simon, l'autre grand performeur de notre discipline, et c'est à Simon Schaffer, donc, par qui tout a commencé, que je cède la place, en t'offrant cette balance, je ne sais pas si tu la vois derrière, derrière Bruno, oui. que j'ai ajoutée au tableau de Holbein et qui n'y fait pas du tout partie, euh, où, devant laquelle Bruno pose, si conscient du sérieux de toute fiction. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Yes, I'm just cool. going to start the presentation. And... Sorry. I'm sorry to get out of the way. <laughs> sorry. What's the one? This is bad. Non, on voit plus le. Yeah, if you can help. 
Yay. Oh, wonderful. It's super. Is it shared? It is. Thank you very much. Can you tell me how to move it forward? Just that. that yes. Cool. Thank you. Right. Shall I start? Yes. Cool. I, I don't think you need an introduction. Hmm. <laughs> But, all right. Well, it hello, <laughs> everyone. Um, it's an enormous honor for me to have been invited here. Um, the very gracious invitation from Bernadette, I think, emerged from a uh, extremely memorable conversation that she and I had in the wake of a meeting in memory and in honor of Bruno Latour at the Ecole des Mines uh, last October. Um, the material that I want to present um, emerges from two projects that I'm currently involved in. One is, and it precisely, of course it does, uh, follows on what Frederic has just been so brilliantly evoking for us, the role of fables and parables in the management of hardware in early modern Europe, and especially the themes of the fabulous and the parabolic in the way in which the history of mechanics has been written, what could be more appropriate for two great parabolists, Michel Serre and Bruno Latour, and on the other hand, a project that I'm involved in, in a minor way, with my great friend, Bruno's great friend, Adam Lowe, the director of Factum Arte, based in Madrid, um, who are engaged at the moment in making, analyzing, and distributing an extraordinary reproduction rep of the great van der Weyden altarpiece in the Hospice in Bonn, one version of which appeared above the altar in the Chapelle Saint-Louis in the Salpetriere during the funeral service of Bruno Latour in October of 2022, in the midst of which I found myself standing in front of the Last Judgment in the immediate wake of the Eucharist, reading out a extract from Irreduction to the vast mourning congregation. Totally traumatic and absolutely memorable event. It's the intersection of those two events that have prompted this. I'll start. Quote, everyone talks of the history of sciences as if it existed, but I don't know. Unquote. I can't do the Gascon accent. <laughs> Sorry. So declared Michel Serre at the start of La Distribution, Hermes IV. So Hermes from La Fontaine. This was rather disconcerting when I first read it 50 years ago. As a junior reader, as I was then, starting the process of being trained in a field that apparently didn't actually exist. <laughs> Sarah explained to us that the aim was to define what he described as the cultural formation called science. It was claimed this task had been accomplished nowhere and faced considerable, but basically overwhelming, obstacles. At a moment when, as we heard so well from Stephen yesterday, so he otherwise indicated, histories of the sciences were in hock to Bachelardian models, the more desirable image of scientific development on offer appeared on sales showing 
glacial. Seemingly following the example of Auguste Comte, one was to think of what Sayer called the general flow, flow is the key word, right? The general flow of knowledge interrupted by what he called stadial thresholds at which the entirety of scientific knowledge was reorganized, unquote. The task for the history of science on his claim was to describe what he called the frontal moraine of the glacier at such stages in its course. And one was to trace sections at right angles to the direction of flow. Well, Saud by then held a chair in the history of science in Paris for some years, as you well know. He much later recalled with considerable hostility what he called, I quote, the rather Neolithic condition of history of science in the 1970s. That means Conguiem, I think. It wasn't entirely clear to us when and where the equivalent of a Bronze Age or even Iron Age, if you were being really ambitious, historiography would ever emerge. Sell was the greatest cartographer of temporal sequences. He was concerned, as we well know, with making sense of fresh beginnings. And in statue, highly significantly, he associates them with either derelict or falling stones. For example, as we heard yesterday from Michael, the invention of geometry by Thales at the pyramids, or significantly for what I'm going to be talking about, what he called the birth of modern science in the Renaissance, which he reckoned was defined by the study of dropping rocks. The claim that modern science was inaugurated with studious attention to falling stones, put early modern rational mechanics right at the center of this moraine. I quote from uh, the third edition of Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica, the causes assigned to natural effects of the same kind this is the first rule of philosophy, according to Newton. Right? The causes assigned to natural effects of the same kind must be the same. The example is the fall of stones in Europe and in America, unquote. So this looked like a plausible stadial threshold. In La Distribution, Serre insisted that in its instauration, as much for the pure sciences in the Hellenic dawn as for the experimental sciences of the classical age, took place in an agonistic field, unquote. And for the balance of the talk, I'm simply going to suppose that we take agonistic field absolutely literally. Serre remarked of the most important of the Hellenistic sources that what he called misfortune or rather cultural history. I love that move. Misfortune or rather cultural history dictated for example, and it's his favoured example, that Archimedean machines were only used in war. La Distribution described a martial game in the classical age through which he suggested in a rare reference to any biographical detail that like many philosophers, René Descartes pursued his military craft in metaphysics. Well, what was his military craft? This, exactly this. On the left, 
the most important textbook of Cartesian natural philosophy in the second half of the 17th century, which is Sanguedius's Naturalis Philosophiae, printed in Leiden in 1686, in which every Dutch university student is taught how the world works by reflecting on what happens when suicidal gunners point their guns at each other. <laughs> and on the right, the founding image of Newtonian mechanics, which is the way in which a cannonball will, at sufficient velocity, become the moon. <laughs> I rest my case. It's like the Goya fighters. No, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, no, it's absolutely that. So that's to set up a relation between balance, war, a certain kind of apparatus, and the figure of rational mechanics. I would now go on to juxtapose this with the much more celebrated material with which Sayer was so canonically concerned and which Frederic evoked so well. So I kind of don't have to. So that's great. The Wolf and the Lamb, Le Lou et l'Agneau, is one of many, but no doubt the favorite, fabula case with which Sayer explored the theme I've just tried to summarize. Of course, many others, as you will know much, much better than I, tried out similar kinds of exegesis. I'm thinking, for example, of Louis Marin's remarkable essay on The Wolf and the Lamb, which first appeared in 1985, significantly, I think, in the Festschrift for Grema, and was then read by Derrida in one of his late seminars in a very famous passage. Marin finds the wolf and the lamb overflowing with the resonances of Pascal's pensée. And as we know, for Serre, the resonance is not at all that, but Descartes' meditations. Um, a philological point, or rather to be specific, a point about translation. Look how much I've had to A point about translation. I notice the following chiasmus. In La Distribution, this I take it is well known, but I thought this was really interesting. In La Distribution, the reading of The Wolf and the Lamb is divided into two parts. And the two parts have subheadings. The subheading of the first part is La Fontaine's Meditation. And the subheading of the second part is Descartes' fable. So the author of the meditations is credited with writing a fable, and the author of the fables is credited with a meditation. If we're thinking about translation, in the American translation of that text, the subheadings are omitted. Why? Why? <laughs> More interestingly, much more interestingly for me, and I'm desperately hoping for you, is that both in the extraordinarily potent and brilliant reading of the fable and its extension in the posthumously published collection of notes that Frederic uh, so well described, the key word in Sale's gloss is obviously demonstration, demonstration. Um, that is to say, the idea is that the lamb demonstrates and La Fontaine shows. It's obviously better in French, right? Démontré, montré. Not only that, but in the Entretien, in Éclaircissement, Latour and Serre spend a long time thinking together and separately about how the work of demonstration, keyword, proceeds in this and similar cases. 
Latour questions Serre about exactly what counts as a demonstration. Why? Because, according to Latour, you make its working hidden from the public, unquote. Serre responded that his demonstrations involved, quote, the extraction of the maximum of results from a minimum of suppositions, unquote. That's Archimedes. That's exactly the Archimedean lever in which a small displacement exerts a large effect. Serre confirms that reading. Suppose a point, he tells Latour, you derive a world, unquote. The engagement with the wolf and the lamb is their favored example in the conversation. Both by form, it has a demonstrative form, and by content, it's about a demonstration. It turns out that a limpid text, limpid as the river by which these tragic events take place, was shown to contain an orderly structure, thus, as Sayer puts it, a formidable and unexpected rigor. Behind the fable's feigned simplicity, thick and naivety is hidden a grandiose philosophy, unquote. Not only, as he put it, was this a true demonstration, it was also, continuing the quote, faithful to the goal of La Fontaine to carve a rich amount of information into a cherry stone. Beautiful. <clears throat> Unquote. So this drew my attention to the imagery of demonstrations, which as we've just seen from Frederic, is the way in which what cannot be seen is shown. That is no doubt the dominant political and epistemic form of early modern sciences. One reason seems salient, which is that until the 17th century, a demonstration is a geometrical proof and nothing else. It's apodexis. The idea that apodexis could take place on a stage with actors is literally unthinkable in the Lucien Fevre sense until the 1580s when anatomy theatres are built. And what goes on, that's the left-hand image, in an anatomy theatre will from then on be called a demonstration and there will be people called extraordinarily demonstrators who show with knives that the wages of sin are death. That's the slogan on the altar there being carried by the figure on the right. And this is the demonstration that proves that's true. At the same time, as uh, some of us have been working on for an embarrassingly long time, God help us, demonstration then becomes experiment, not the other way around. So performance leeches the authority of geometry in this fascinating way. This is where I would talk about Boyle and Hobbes, but I'm not going to do that. What mattered to experimental demonstration, as you see in this absolutely magnificent Jesuit image of the great pneumatic experiment of the 1650s, which is Otto von Goerke's demonstration of the power of the vacuum. So if you pump the air out of a glass cylinder, it becomes stronger than, in his beautiful phrase, more than 20 or make it 50 strong <laughs> men. There they are. 
that's what 50 strong men looks like at the end of the 30 years war <laughs> this is a demonstration of how to win a war explicitly he is mayor of magdeburg he is in other words in charge of the great scene of military destruction in 17th century europe by far and this is his image of what one should do if one wants to stop that happening. So, demonstration then. As I've already indicated, I'll accelerate now. As I've already indicated, the roots of this are Archimedean. They're explicitly Archimedean. This is the great example, which is due to Plutarch in the life of Marcellus, in other words, a fable, the claim that uh, at Syracuse, Archimedes showed the tyrant the power of mathematics by showing that a single individual, clearly not a cherub. <laughs> I mean, Syracuse is a great city. I strongly advise a visit if you haven't been there. However, I do not believe that this event happened. And even if it did happen, I do not believe that Archimedes used a cherub <laughs> of late 16th century Florentine kind to demonstrate that the principles of mechanics are stronger than the, than the Sicilian Navy. We can discuss afterwards the imbalance of forces that this magnificent image shows. Now for Serre, the one reason why he was obsessing about uh, the role of demonstration in reading uh, The Wolf and the Lamb was exactly as we've already seen, because the claim was that La Fontaine had written a meditation against which and with which Descartes had written a fable. Well, the association Descartes fable is beyond canonical. In one of the very few images, and you'll know this extremely well, that Descartes made during his life, and maybe with his consent by the absolutely brilliant uh, Dutch painter, Jan Baptiste de Venings, this portrait of Descartes made in 1647. He's holding a book, and as we all know, the book says the world is a fable. I mean, it's a, it's a pun because it's also the name of the book that Descartes wrote and then suppressed because of Galileo's trial mm -hmm. in 1630. And I juxtapose it with a passage which is much better known to you than it is to me, which is the explicit presence, of course, of the search for the Archimedean point in the meditation, in the second med meditation, extremely well known text. It's that that Serre seizes on in his gloss on le procès, the trial, the process, which culminates in the death of the lamb. And when you hear the phrase the death of the lamb, you now know where this talk is going. I'll ignore that. I want to emphasize, in other words, the ubiquity of Archimedean iconography inside the politics of machines right through the 17th century. That is not an original thought from the point of view of the historiography of 17th century mechanics, but it's an extremely consequential one for thinking the role of fable and the role of political imbalance. Political imbalance here is shown in 17th century European iconography as a way of articulating what government is. So on the left, you have by far the most brilliant um, Dutch representation of a balance that I'm aware of in the 1600s. And this is an image which is massively distributed right through the 1600s and well into the 1700s. The Synod of Dordrecht, the Synod of Dort, is the founding act of Dutch Reformed religion. 
And what you're shown here is that the combination of Calvin's Institutes and the sword, which are here made equivalent, outweighs, so being heavy is good in the 17th century, my kind of century. <laughs> it, it weighs more than outward trappings. And outward trappings are salvation by works. So salvation by faith is heavy. Salvation by works may look heavy, but it's light. <laughs> so this is a political, theological, and I think natural philosophical argument in which what is present is the secularization of war in the case of salvation. And on the right, exactly the same kind of argument, just much more beautiful because it's a Jesuit propaganda text uh, made in Antwerp in 1640. Uh, images of the first century of the Society of Jesus adequately equipped with Archimedean technology, the Jesuits can move the world. So what's the source? Whence the power? This, the great fabulous tradition of the sequence of displacements of force, of disequilibria, of imbalances, which Archimedes allegedly puts into the foundation of modern mechanics. So this is an early, I, I mean, this is my favorite image. This is an early 18th century French edition of Polybius, the great his classical historian, which is lavishly illustrated for the French court. And you see the balances becoming levers here in time of war. Now, as you will know, in two texts, at least, but at either time, we could go into great detail here, but that would involve using footnotes. So, which would, as uh, Stephen told us, violate the Ceresian principle of exposition. So I'm not going to give you any footnotes. Um, what is so fundamental here is the relation balance lever. That's what the war is doing, right? In that you might think of the balance like the one in Frederick's magnificent evocation of the ambassadors of the Holbein in the case of Durkheim. I wonder if they were related. Um, what is fundamental here is the relation equilibrium, disequilibrium, lever, balance. And what the 17th century Archimedeans were more or less obsessed by was how to make sense of the similitude and the difference of those two devices. So think for a moment about leverage. This is no doubt the greatest image of leverage that I can think of from the Renaissance. So this again is the ceiling of the mathematics studio, the Stanzino dei Mathematici, uh, which is now, which I mean, those rooms, which are the Grand Duke's rooms um, in the Palazzo Vecchio, have become the Uffizi Gallery. Number of people who look at the ceiling when they're walking through this room, one. <laughs> Everyone else is interested in these bloody Botticellis. I'm interested in that if you look up in that room, you see this. And it's no coincidence, as my Marxist comrades would say, that at exactly the moment that these images of balance, imbalance, equilibrium, disequilibrium were being made inside the headquarters of the Tuscan regime, Galileo is publishing his very first, sorry, was writing, he doesn't publish it, was writing his very first essay and his very first exercise in practical mathematics is now called La Bilancetta, the little balance. And it's Galileo's solution to the founding problem in hydrostatics. In other words, the moment when Archimedes streaks through the streets of Syracuse, yelling, Eureka, Eureka, Eureka. Why? Because he's worked out a method for telling 
whether the tyrant's crown is fake or not. In other words, whether it's an alloy or pure gold. So in the two cases I've just given you from Archimedes, they're both fabulous. The Eureka story comes from Vitruvius, obviously, and the ship and war story comes from Plutarch. I have absolutely no other historical evidence for them whatsoever, of course. But the moral of both those stories is, as Bruno Latour beautifully shows in an essay called The Force and Reason of Experiment, a long series of imbalances that the operator is stronger than the ship, that mathematics is stronger than experience, that the figure of the mathematician is stronger than the figure of war. And ultimately, this I think is Bruno's genius, fables are stronger than historical truth. Mm -hmm. Because exactly as in the case of Galileo's trial, what we all know is rubbish but very consequential indeed. Let me close, as I've just been given the hit. As Bernadette Bonsoir de Vincent has pointed out in a chapter of her magnificent biography on Lavoisier and in uh, the English version thereof, the balance will come to occupy an absolutely fundamental role in the theater of proof, precisely her phrase, as well as um, that of Frederic. In other words, it's the figure of the balance that eloquently, certainly right through the classical age until its end during the Napoleonic Wars, the balance will continue both as a system of judgment and as a system of ritual offering of a sacrificial victim those two great tropes of balancing, one of which is, a, is about what making, sorry, is about making what seems the same evidently different, that is judgment, urtile in the Kantian sense, and the offering which makes what seems absolutely different the same. And the example where those two tropes of balance, this I think is completely apparent to both Latour and Serre, as I'm finally going to suggest, the moment, if we can call it that, where all of that political judgment and all of that political sacrifice was brought together is of course the last judgment. And that's why Henriette and Bernadette decided that this would be the last talk. <laughs> so we end where everything will end. As to quote from Le Contre Naturel, science now plays the role of our last judgment, with all that that implies. Well, the last judgment is uh, come on do it why will it not move is it frozen yeah bro this is the last judgment so the project that i'm involved in is to study and make a as very high accuracy as possible replica of that that is the central panel of the inner part of one of the greatest paintings, no doubt, of the 15th century, Roger van der Weyden's Last Judgment. You see St. Michael and our Lord, and St. Michael is judging the saved and the damned. There is, however, sorry, grammar shaffer. There are, however, two completely remarkable, I mean, there are about 48, but there are, there are two completely remarkable aspects to this image. And that's where I'll end. One is that in this image, the saved 
are lighter. <laughs> in, in the great northern tradition, and here the great northern tradition is represented as usual by Zürich, the saved are, of course, heavier because they have more virtue. They have more power. They have more force. Secondly, in the great tradition, the demons, the devils, who I find absolutely captivating in the good and the bad sense, have the function of pulling down the damned yeah, in order to distort judgment. In the Van der Weyden, there are no demons. Panofsky's great reading of this image is that this is an image of virtue saving itself by its own power. No demons. The angels are simply there as a basically off the top of the screen, a uh, musical band will just play. They're not actually doing anything at all. Whereas normally they intervene. Why does that matter? In the case of Latour, it matters clearly conceptually, but it also matters biographically. Latour reminisces that when he was a boy in Bonn, he would meditate four hours. Sorry, for hours, not four hours. <laughs> for hours on this painting because it was being administered by his father. And it appeared, as we saw at the start, at his memorial service very appropriately. In the, in the case of Serre, right at the start of um, the uh, La Fontaine book, when he's meditating on the series of fables that Frederic and I have both been reading so carefully, I quote from him, I'll finish with this quote, the balance, as he says, symbolizes a right, which tries desperately to invent a justice within infernal disorder. And I tried to do that too. Thank you. Thank you very much for this quite fabulous uh, presentations indeed. Uh, may the speakers maybe come here. We have approximately like 13 minutes of questions. So please be short <laughs> in, your, uh, in your interventions. So who wants to start? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Just to start out, uh, I'll, uh, early as you spoke, uh, Oliette, uh, uh, I had a thought. I'm just offering uh, it as a, a, a thought and a comment. It was when you uh, mentioned uh, quite early on about Sarah and the objection to uh, 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 the natural contract. Well, who's going to sign? And he says, well, who was signing Rousseau's contract? Yeah. Um, but that made me think, um, eight years before the publication of Rousseau's contract, um, I suppose the most famous book on the law in, by an 18th century Frenchman was published, uh, Montesquieu's De l'Esprit des Lois, yeah? Um, a fascinating book. Uh, natural law features in it. Um, but it's not at all like uh, the social contract or uh, uh, natural law features in it doesn't dominate it by any chance, because it's about understanding the mind of the law. Yes. Uh, well, it, it's a debatable, very debatable title from when it first came out, in fact. But uh, the point is, um, uh, it's not a philosophy of law, a philosophy of right at all. It's... Um, uh, an examination of law in relation to societies. Many aspects of society they are to be understood with reference to economics, to commerce, to politics, to religion, and, 
uh, of particular relevance to the natural environment in which particular societies are located. Montesquieu even went on to write a small theory of the earth, the whole earth, which may be of relevance too. Um, and that made me think with reference to the parliament of things, yes? Uh, and if there is a mode of understanding law, which actually one would find in Montesquieu, but, uh, but not in Rousseau, and in, not in natural law theory, uh, which approximates uh, 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 to something like a parliament of things, because there's all sorts of things in de l'esprit des lois, yeah? Um, uh, so I just offer that thought as, a, because ancestral things, be it natural law, be it Rousseau, and traditions of contract theory, uh, um, uh, are interesting. So, you know, if we go Rousseau, Serre, I'd go, Montesquieu, Latour, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Has she? Yeah. Oh, oh, good. <laughs> uh, thank you to all three of you. Very enjoyable final panel. I have a question for Frédéric. Um, in listening to you, I thought at one point about um, Robert Cantarella's series of performances called Faire le Gilles, which you might know for you, for those who haven't seen it. It's um, listening to recorded lectures by Deleuze through an earpiece and speaking them live, lectures that he hadn't listened to before. So it's a kind of ventriloquist performance where he operates this sort of transubstantiation and lets himself become Deleuze. Uh, giving the lecture in front of the audience. I'm sorry, Contarella. Um, and if, if I heard you correctly at dinner last night, I think at one point you said that there's somebody who kind of plays la, who's the go-to Latour performer in your company. And so since here you were showing us Latour on stage, I wondered about how this kind of staging of thought changes when it's not Latour himself, but somebody playing Latour, and there's that layer of substitution, if that is different in terms of the representation presentational uh, questions that we might raise. <laughs> 